Uh, Joan Shigakawa, thank you very much, uh, is uh, uh, Deputy Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts and is currently the highest ranking person at the NEA. Uh, to her right is Mike Orloff, who is a director at the NEA, who's got a portfolio that involves uh, performing things and international things, right? <laughs> sure. Um, uh, that's a technical term. Uh, uh, and then uh, to her left is Dan Lurie, and uh, who's also a director at the NEA, and I don't know what your portfolio is. Strategic partnerships. Strategic partnerships. And I, I don't know what that means either. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, they're very anxious to hear uh, what you, uh, where, where you land. Uh, so I now turn it over to Jason. Awesome, cool. We had uh, a number of different teams here. I appreciate you for participating and diving in. Matt, as a designer, is probably the hardest part uh, about what we do. What we ask you to do in 45 minutes, we typically do in a week, right? So we talk about compression. Um, it's hard to get over the fear of understanding all the people on your team, the dynamics, like who's got what background or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, your talents and skills can be used also for solving social challenges and igniting the fire and igniting the conversation for further development and kind of creating some really rich uh, discussion about how to approach these things. Um, so I'm not going to uh, uh, pontificate any longer. What I want to do is we'll get each team up here. We'll give uh, the, each team three minutes. I'll play the uh, gatekeeper, uh, but let's bring one of the first teams up. You look like you're ready to go. You're jumping off your seat. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Let me start my timer. Whole team can come up if you'd like. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Shira Zamardi, and I'm team Roadwork too. <laughs> um, so everyone knows what the mission was. We have $130 million to donate to communities across America, but through organizations on individuals alone. So one of the ideas that we came up with was to create co-ops across America. These co-ops can be um, multifunctional spaces um, for artists who can use it as a workshop to do their work, or you know, writers they need a place to go to write, or for performing arts, you can also um, host performing arts, uh, plays, and things of that nature, but also it can be market space too. One of the assets that we thought would be great to add was a sort of financial incentive to get people to participate. And one way is, there's a lot of starving artists out there, a lot of star starving writers. Why not give them an opportunity to also make money as well? And that money, a portion of it can go back to the co-op, can go back to the community as well. One way that we thought it was a great way for people to earn the money or organizations to give out the money to artists was for artists in the community to volunteer at schools that don't have a um, budget for music or arts or drama. So a lot of these people can go to the local schools and volunteer once a week as a music teacher, give you know drama classes, writing workshops at like you know a lot of lower income schools. So that's the way that they can earn the money and use the spaces as well. Um, let's see. Um, we were also the, the um, community participation in our events. Yeah. Too, and the uh, so yeah, so community can also get involved and participate and also give, you know, sort of like an incentive for the community to come in too. And that was something that we were thinking about. Um, the community arts days where they create art. Everybody creates art. Yeah, so yeah, we'll have like, Know, you know, calendar events to get the community to participate, to get awareness out of this co-op, to um, to also give them an idea of like where their money is going. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so. So the main framework will be a website that's been created at the national level. And from there that they will be able to like post things, um, post events and post um, pictures of stuff like I guess the creative, I'm sorry, the social aspect to it is like you can share and 
your, uh, your photos and the things that you're doing will be up on the website. Um, so the communities create their own art. This isn't something where some benevolent forces are coming in and saying, this is the kind of art that you should be appreciating. This is used as a space for the local artists, I guess, throughout time, yeah. to, to create their own art. Bringing, bringing it back, back to, to the, the local level. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. stars in America are local artists who need our support and above all the number one thing that they need is exposure so what we want to do is we want to make art cool and we're gonna do this I'm gonna grab this so I can read the no I'm not um, <laughs> go for it thanks okay so we're gonna work from the bottom up so first what we want to do is we were trying to think about how to get every community in America involved so what we want to do is start at the local level and here we'll have local mentors who are helping local artists, whether it's you know the old lady down the road who does amazing knitted afghans, whether it's a young aspiring poet, a singer, any you know, somebody who builds sand castles, whatever it is. Um, have the local community vote and nominate who from their zip code, their area code, whatever we want to break it up by, will go on to the state level. So get this exposure in the local community and get community spirit. Next, we're going to go to the state level. We were thinking we could leverage state fairs, right? Somewhere that ev something every state has, where people come from all over the state and support the arts, get fun, you know, have fun, see something new, right? So at the state fair, we have local judging. People can promote, you know, get excited about the art, and most of all, promote local art tourism. So the winner of each state fair, we're going to have American Idol for art basically. <laughs> so what we're thinking is a big televised thing. We've got online sponsors, celebrity judges, America Votes. The great thing about this is something like this would make revenue from advertisements that could go back to the arts. And we were also hoping, hoping to leverage online sponsors to help the artists promote themselves after the show. So the primary goal here is not to give money directly to the artists, but it is to help them gain the exposure that they need for a prolonged successful career in art and to quote unquote make art cool, excite local tourism, etc. And the great thing about this is it's repeatable, it can happen every year, it'll fund itself because of advertising. Um, and everyone wins, even the person who doesn't win the competition at the national level, everyone who has somebody from their community involved in nominating them, in rooting for them, has gained exposure for their art. Thank you. I'm just going to take the whole thing. So, so the goal that we kind of focused in on was um, supporting the arts and doing it through every community and we kind of split up and talked about it. Talked about it uh, based on school district um, because it's already pre-established. It's, you know, the entire country is already divided. All the kids go to school. So it's a very, you can hit a lot of people and make a lot of impact without having to develop a structure, without having to create an infrastructure. And also we have, you know, all the resources with the government and the state and the local level. So that was where, like, our target audience, the U.S. school district. And then we have, like, local artists, which we heard about that. And then the schools, the students, where there's a lot of art programs missing. So we're gonna like we're gonna take the money to support artists coming into the schools, um, you know, exposing children to you know a multitude of artists, but then also you know programs like field trips, things like that. So there's a lot of exposure, and then from that, we also would like to develop a mentoring kind of like you know, kind of based on the big brother, big sister, like a big artist, little artist maybe. Um, so a way to like continue that process, continue that um, exposure to art, develop relationships, get the community involved. So there's like the community.
community artists, the local kids, um, beautification products so the entire community can see what's happening, can like feel it, get interactive, start getting more and more information, um, and increase art appreciation, um, the bridge generational um, kind of gaps in the community so that you know older artists who maybe don't have school children can come in and talk to them and find a kid that becomes passionate about woodworking or knitting or sandcastles. I really like that, by the way. Um, yeah, so art share on a community level with the schools, and I think where the we did talk about building a um, a website, you know, so that people have resources, local artists, local schools, um, use the community, use the the structure we have, the people we have to go to the schools, kind of reach out and talk to different artists and say, can you come in? You know, it's not a huge time commitment. Just talk to this class of students, do a little interaction thing. You know, here's some supplies. Here's a way to get, for kids to get their hands dirty, for you to develop relationships with the students, and then maybe some, some of those relationships can be taken outside of school, continuing developing mentor, protege, you know, artist, apprentice, going back to history, so that's what we got. We also talked about possibly facilitating this to an to a online matching program, kind of, so we were thinking about matching school districts mm -hmm. to artists. the community of artists. Okay, Cupid. Okay, Cupid. Except not creepy, like, like for her. Her. <laughs> And that would be a persistent framework. That could last a long time. We figured that could actually double the participation and go on for almost from a volunteer basis once this whole thing is launched. So it would be less expensive in the future to run the volunteer parties or share. of making sure there's community involvement. This needs to be community driven or it's really not going to work at all. At the same time, we want to make sure that there is equitable disbursement of funds. So disbursement across geography, disbursement across the different areas of the art, and also quality of access to the process. So one model that we looked at was a Kickstarter type of model where you would have um, community driven pitching for funds that would then be matched. We saw a couple of issues with this process. One is that by going on a strict dollar basis, you're excluding sectors of the community that maybe don't have a lot of money, don't have access to a lot of money. So there's got to be ways that you can do kind of equivalent types of bidding and show that you've got support and still be able to meet those funding. So the process that we came up with is that you would make an application to artsroot.com. There's a couple ways that you could make it past the initial um, kind of baseline barrier. One would be to do more of a traditional kind of like arts grant where you prepare a grant proposal, you work with grants, applications, folks on the staff. The other one would be by doing something like setting up an initial fundraising page, going out and getting community support and get yourself over that initial threshold to prove that you have enough support in the community to kind of qualify for a full fundraising page. So fundraising page would be very similar to Kickstarter or any of the other crowdfunding ones where you could post videos. You have testimonials from people who have already worked with your particular organization, um, and then you'll form where you can go and pledge. So you've got your community group, dear.org, are going to the community and driving people to the site, building support for their application. Go through the donation app. You can pledge three different things. You can do dollar amounts, as little as a dollar, just to signify that you support, all the way up to however much you want to uh, donate. You can pledge time donations. So you can donate time to either the uh, organizations existing initiatives or the new initiative that they're asking for funding or you can provide testimonials or additional kind of user generated content that would help flesh out the application and kind of help drive this virtuous circle of community involvement in the thing. Um, so these would be kind of added up according to a formula that would assign different weights to chits say so for a dollar donation you might have like one chit per dollar 
time donation, maybe five chits for every dollar that you, for every hour that you that you pledge. User generated content, maybe three chits for like a nice long testimonial. That would add up. You'd have your little meter. When you reach your goal, you would get matched funds from Artroots.com, perhaps according to a sliding scale based on you know theater groups because they have a physical plant might need one for one matching funds. Literary folks who are you know. I don't know, I just roughed it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Keeps you focused. You're okay. Um, I'm pretty much done. Okay. So, there you go. Let me tell you. Well, let's design it straight. We've got 30 minutes. Yeah. All right, great, perfect. One team, what What other teams haven't gone yet? Two Team Roslyn right now. One, one team, two teams, three teams, four teams gone? Four teams gone. Okay, perfect. Hello, hello. Okay. Hi, we're Team Roslyn. Uh, in the beginning of this exercise, we kind of went back and forth around these sort of very vague definitions. Uh, you know, um, the arts, literature, I mean, those are really big things. Community. So we kind of went back and forth in our discussions about this. So we don't have a name yet. Maybe we will by the end of this. But your, the pitch line is YouTube for the arts. Okay? YouTube for the arts. And so we sort of walked through this outline in our exercise. And we're going to hit every community by uh, using this idea, this solution, um, by putting it in schools. And so instead of just having your standard uh, textbook that you bring to you know, home with you to do your work, uh, you'd actually go onto this platform. It'd be a learning platform, kind of similar to like lynda.com, uh, where you could actually see videos of performances. We really talked a lot about like dance performances in ours. We're really all really happy about that. I think a lot of Beyonce talk, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, if you really wanted to get an additional sort of perspective on things, you could go onto this platform, you can look up the content and information. Uh, and so, you know, as a student, it would also be open to public schools, private schools, um, anyone, young adults, universities. So we reached that aspect of it. And um, the economic impact is that people could actually sell their lessons, you know, like, your performance of how to do Beyonce single ladies. So you could actually sell that as a product on there. If you're like the local dance instructor, it gets the exposure and often hits what a lot of people are talking about, getting the local musicians, artists, it gets them exposure that they need by putting them on this platform. Um, let's see, we go through, oh yeah, and so that was our other pitch. It's the Etsy of how to dance like Beyonce 101. The Etsy, how to dance like Beyonce 101. Um, Cultural. So we were talking a lot about this, that uh, a lot of the arts programs in high schools are often cut, you know, lack of funding. So this would be a way to preserve that, restore and preserve it, uh, especially where it's lost. Um, one thing we did talk about, additional assets. Um, we could say that, you know, one asset would be nice if we sort of paired this in with the way that uh, schools get money every year with like from the federal government. If you want to get the money from the federal government, you also include us in your sort of standards. Uh, so our pitch for that was, instead of no child left behind, no artist left behind. Um, and then, oh yeah, so it was a way for it to be kind of remembered or sort of institutionalized. There's that additional asset, but also having like an arts month would be really cool. Also some cool uh, tie-ins with celebrities could be done, like having Beyonce be part of, you know, this class where she actually goes to a school and you know, does a little bit of like the dance as part of something. That would be a really good way for the public to know about it. Also, the, the entire idea itself is a form of art. I mean, people are uploading their own videos or their instructional how-tos. I mean, that is art in itself. So I think that's a good way for also you know, people to realize the importance of this tool. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Uh, wow. You should be a <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Next team, come on up. Dribble that's 
populated by community and artists. So we wanted to um, provide you know, rural communities or different places with um, something like a TV or something where they can access it. Um, and, uh, and then it can be populated by schools where they you know, get the resources to contribute. And um, students can use it as a way to showcase their art and potentially you know, get in contact with colleges. And uh, in the same way, we also <laughs> had the same kind of American Idol with uh, art. Um, but we also wanted to look at it measurably and look at the economics of it. So we wanted to see if we could um, have some kind of art footprint that you could keep track of to see how much consumption there is, to measure whether it increased um, art consumption in the community, like outside of you know, having on-demand um, artists to look at things for your community across the nation. Um, but to see if that increased um, your local consumption and if that could be used to request funds from the government or from other organizations and then also as a way to access different mentoring. so that it's not us for correctly funded, but we're just the framework to establish the role. Uh, one thing that uh, sort of an aspect that would greatly help her is if we had some like, strong business contacts, we're thinking to make this effort self-sustaining. We want to create a something like the bread campaign, the things are sold, that sort of used to fund the project in perpetuity. I'm actually talking to a lot of you guys here. And I guess the last thing to uh, to get an idea of sort of traction on the ground and bring it to life, we thought one great idea would be to uh, hire Safety and Nitro. They're the great guys, so thank you that. But also, in all serious, we also wanted to sort of emphasize the art for all, and we're going to have a strong teaching component, so keep it going from generation to generation. I think Bashini and you should talk a bit more about uh, arts for all, and then uh, Adriana can talk a bit more about the, uh, the campaign. Uh, we were basically thinking that. Um, to sustain the entire community with uh, this entire campaign and stuff like that, we have to give back to the community so that they will go on doing whatever they want to do. And that, we have, and that way, uh, we could think of teaching, you know. So it's not just the people who perform or entertain the people and go off, but people who are getting entertained actually get to learn, and then they spurge off, they go back to their own communities, teach, and it, it's like a tree. So they go back and they do whatever they actually want to do in their own communities so that their communities thrive and art thrives along with it. So, right, so this, uh, taking the Red Cafe as an example, instead of a website or a location, what we need is a system. So we're like, artists, art, target audience and a community will be the input and the output will be events, sales, websites, social media, and all those things that come out of it. to go back to preschool for a day. 
Um, what we want to do is actually remind people that art is about joy. It's not necessarily about having invested a great deal of time in a specific skill, but that you go, you collaborate, you make something, and you have fun doing it. Um, so we have this idea, it's sort of a summer arts day. What we're hoping to do is take municipal spaces, schools, libraries, and convert them into collaborative art spaces for a day where people can get together um, and actually create whatever it is that they want to create, get feedback, have interaction. Uh, the, the piece that we're going to be able to provide, besides hopefully the partnerships that can get us into those new, <coughs> excuse me, municipal spaces, is that we'd like to have a portal where by geography people can actually go and essentially announce their interest in participating, get in, and you can start to see participation as people sign up. Um, we're hoping that this can also become a capture point for once you've created art, you can post it, you can make it uh, available for other people to see. And in this way, it is its own art project. You have art everywhere, literally. That's the end. <laughs> and we want more money! <laughs> So, if you can't see the graph, there's essentially, so surrounding the platform, 
There's artists creating content that go to organizations that help collect, and, and the money goes to those organizations that basically help generate content. The content then goes into the platform, the, the curators then tag and organize the structure of the data, and we have another group of uh, artists and educators who are building the curriculum that goes back into the platform, which then generate new artists to create new content, and it continues in a cycle. Uh, then we have our oh, uh, yes, yes. our prime um, high profile advocates. They spread the word. So Beyonce is will go out and tell everybody to go to these organizations. <laughs> we can target all of our users, all of this lifelong learning that we want to promote. Because we have enough advocates, and we can hit pretty much every number of it. And we we're going to have photos for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, what? 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 She said, she had another great idea, which then you can extend the program to. So uh, artists as teachers, so not just teaching the performing and, and visual arts, but artists teaching through their medium other subjects, which I thought was a fantastic idea. Got it. Okay. Now I'm done. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. We'll, uh, I, I was trying to pull out themes uh, from this, which we'll get to with Jason and I don't talk too long uh, in a minute. Uh, so. Jason and I co-founded UX for Good in 2010. I am not a designer. I don't know how to do any of the things that the people in this room know how to do. Jason is a designer. Uh, so why did we do this? We did this to set the bar as high as we could for design. We wanted to create the project or the challenge that was at the very edge of what design could do. Uh, so that it uh, would push the industry to uh, get better and better at what it did, but just as importantly would show designers that they're more powerful than they thought they were. Uh, when we started in 2010, uh, it was a fight. And the fight came from inside the design industry. The first piece that anybody wrote about what we were doing uh, uh, what the headline was, uh, UX for good is bullshit. Uh, and, uh, and at first we were angry, and then after about a minute uh, or two, I decided that that was a good sign. That meant that we had hit uh, a nerve, and uh, that the industry and the argument on the other side uh, was that designers should go back and do what designers do. And UX designers in particular should go back and optimize websites and should not get ahead of their skis. And we thought, well, we're not sure that's accurate. So in 2010, uh, we tried this, much like with a group like this, but we gave it 20 minutes, by the way. Uh, and we videotaped the proceedings. We had no idea if this would work. And we sent it off to the nonprofit, and they said, who the hell are these people? And why no one asked our permission, what are you doing? But we've never heard any of these ideas before. It's really interesting. So we convened the first UX for Good in 2011 in the middle of Chicago in winter, which looked a lot like Thursday here. <laughs> and, uh, and people came from around the country, and we put them into five rooms to tackle five social challenges in, uh, in, in two days. Uh, and it was interesting, mostly because we watched a room full of people, uh, most of whom we didn't know, say, holy cow, I didn't know I could jump so high and throw so far. Uh, I just had no idea I had that in me. So the next year, I, actually funny part, we walk up to the podium to say thank you for coming. And Jason, for reasons that are inexplicable to us now, uh, both of us say next year in New Orleans, we have no idea what this means, and we leave the stage and go home. Later people remind us that we've said this. Uh, so the next year, we, uh, we tailored it down uh, to the 12 best designers we could find in the country. And we all embedded in New Orleans, uh, this time for four or five days uh, in which we tackled the problem of the music economy. Stand standard living for professional musicians in New Orleans is abysmal, even though millions and millions and millions flowed through the economy. And the designers there did some miraculous stuff. We encourage you to look at what they did. The next year, last year we were in Vancouver with the Dalai Lama Center. His Holiness gave out a, uh, presented a challenge that said, how do we educate the hearts of children? How do we get social emotional learning into schools at a big scale? We embedded there, went into classrooms, um, uh, went into classrooms, went into conferences with brain scientists, all of this, and designed a pretty miraculous thing. You can learn more about that too. 
Uh, we are now ready. Uh, this is our announcement of what 2014 is, uh, what our challenge is. So now I turn it over to Jason. <laughs> so uh, being a designer, I've seen our industry move from optimizing websites to actually just even setting up kind of an e-commerce business or platform or organizations to then optimizing and focusing on many different things, moving into kind of focusing then on customer experience and uh, at the center of it all for every one of us as a designer is understanding the human condition, what motivates individuals to do the things that they do, and then hopefully an opportunity to design and support those. And a lot of that has to deal with much of what was discussed today, information architecture and interaction design and research and great and creative, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's a really an, an imperative thing that we take this and continue to push this the outer limits. Why is that? It's because we're entering this world of um, looking at not just the mobile app, right? Not just the website, but we're looking at the mobile app and the website and the and the and, right? And so that begets more of a larger experience for someone. And that means that we have to more deeply understand how, how and what it is that gets at people to be able to uh, enli uh, enlist a certain behavior, right? Uh, what pushes them over the edge to take action, or what further supports a, a, a behavior that we want to see repeated, or even further, what creates a behavior that is not happening yet, right? To us, sometimes that looks like conversion, right? Make sense? Who, who works on e-commerce type or related sorts of things? Yeah? Okay, great. So you get the point. This year, we're going to focus uh, our time and attention working with the Aegis Trust, and the Genocide Memorial uh, in Kigali, Rwanda. And we're going to spend a week there in June um, researching and immersing ourselves, seeing what's going on, uh, and taking that work into London where we design uh, with the Aegis Trust uh, a way to help convert right, this, em this emotional, intellectual, gut-wrenching experience of people walking out of a museum and convert that into action. And that's what our challenge is this year. Uh, we're really excited to have been invited uh, to World IA, World IA Day in DC. Uh, and it was kind of the timing was perfect because we've met with a handful of really tremendous agencies and organizations over the last few days, uh, with the exception of the snow day, which seems to close down everything. Uh, so, uh, so let me use a minute yeah. to, to tell these folks what I heard from this, right? are two things that I thought were relatively, that were novel to me, but may, you may call you know, every day. And that is, is that uh, the, the two things that emerged for me from all the various ideas is that the money that you give out should be reconceptualized as seed funding to create a self-sustaining funding model. So like in a venture capital model, the money goes in the intent is not that we have to put the money back in next year, but that it feeds a system that spins out its own revenue source, whether it's advertising or something else. That that's the best way to make an investment in a community to allow the community then to become self-sustaining, in this case, a national arts community. So one is $130 million reconceptualized, not as support for activities, but as seed funding that will create revenue for to support activities. That was one. The other is uh, that artists are the labor force as opposed to the treasured class that we're trying to support the work of. That artists who have made it through the system enough to become artists, what we're really trying to do is put them to work in a way to create the next round of artists. That that's the role of artists in America is to create the next generation of artists in America. And almost every program did that. I mean, sometimes it was called Beyonce. But, uh, <laughs> uh, it, but that was the message of the Beyonce. Or American Idol for the Arts. Right, but the idea is is that what we, the reason we support artists is because of the next round of people not creating art, but creating the generation that will create art. And the reason we have money is not to spend it on performance or activities, but to create the venture fund metaphorically, that will support that. So 130 is silly. The arts is 3.4% of the gross domestic product. 
3.2%, sorry, 3.2% uh, of the gross domestic product. That is, I mean, the point is that's all working for us and $130 million is a seed investment to get that supporting the rest of the artists. Okay, that was my interpretation as one guy. All right, uh, so we do that in a week, uh, but you know, but it's genocide, so we, it takes a week. Uh, so uh, the, uh, we ask you, if you're interested in the stuff we're doing, please go look at it, uxforgood.com.org, any way you want to spell it. We now own all those domains. Uh, the, uh, go look at it, follow us, uh, pay attention to what we're doing. You guys are, uh, you folks are heroes to those of us who aren't you. And uh, you may not know this because this is all you do all day, but you have a constellation of skills and perspectives that the rest of the world does not have. And our argument is that it's not just that you have the opportunity, but you have a social obligation to use them to make the world better. Don't clean up parks. We don't need you cleaning up parks. The rest of us can clean up parks. Redesign the world.